Hello, and welcome to Toneless Painting with M. Francis McCarthy. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and welcome as well to 25 Days of Tonalism, Volume 2, Day 4. And a little bit misleading, I guess, today because the artist that I'm doing a study after is um, not a tonalist. His name is Arnold Bocklin. And the name of the painting I'm doing a study after is Between Two Rock Walls. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that I felt this uh, painting of Arnold's had a toneless feel and quality to it. And I absolutely love Arnold Bucklin. He's what I would type as a symbolist, and that's a, um, a style of a genre of painting that I really, really like a lot, especially the old guys. Um, not so interested in modern symbolism or symbolists, but uh, Arnold Bachlin, one of my all-time favorite painters, no question about it. So I saw this as an opportunity to work in um, some of his work. And um, now uh, I found a link to a uh, website that is dedicated to his work, and I will be including that link in today's uh, corresponding blog post. And I should point out on the corresponding blog post to this video, you'll be able to find a higher resolution um, image of my study after Arnold uh, Arnold's painting. And uh, maybe a little information uh, um, about uh, the painting itself. And of course, uh, there'll be a link to the video and all that other good stuff there. Anyway, let's read a little bit about um, from his biography off of this uh, website. Arnold Bocklin was born on October 16, 1827 in Basel. He attended the Dusseldorf Academy. At this time he painted scenes of the Swiss Alps using light effects and dramatic views subjectively to promote emotional moods onto the landscape. In 1848 this romantic introspection gave way to plein air objectivity after he was influenced by Camille Corot, Eugene Delacroix, and the painters of the Barbizon School. See, no surprise, Barbizon, tonalist, you know, one, two, three. Um, but after the February and June revolutions, Buckland returned to Basel with a lasting hatred and disgust for contemporary France, and he resumed painting gloomy mountain scenes. <laughs> Uh, in 1850, Bachlin found this Mecca in Rome, and immediately his paintings were flooded by the warm Italian sunlight. He populated the lush southern vegetation, the bright light of the Roman Campagna, and the ancient ruins with lonely shepherds, cavorting nymphs, and lusty centaurs. These mythological figures, rather than the landscapes, became, became Bachlin's primary concern, and he used such themes as pan pursuing syrinx to express the polarities of life, warm sunshine contrasts with cool, moist shade, and the brightness of woman's spirituality contrasts with man's dark sensuality. When Bachlin returned to Basel with his Italian wife, he completed the painting which brought him fame when the king of Bavaria purchased it in 1858. Pan among the reeds, a depiction of the Greek phallic god with whom the artist identified. He taught at the Academy of Art in Weimar from 1860 to 1862. When he returned to Rome, called to Basel in 1866, he painted the frescoes and modeled the grotesque mass for the fa facade of the Basel Museum. Bachlin resided in Florence from 1874 until 1885, and this was his most active period. He continued to explore male-female antithesis antithesis and painted religious scenes, allegories of nature's powers, and moody studies of man's fate. He ceased working with oils and began experimenting with tempera and other media to obtain pictorial surface free of brush strokes. Buckland spent the next seven years mostly in Switzerland with occasional trips to Italy. He devoted much of his energy to designing an airplane. Following a stroke in 1892, he returned to Italy, bought a villa uh, in some place I can't pronounce, and died there on January 16, 1901. Many of his late works depict nightmares of war, plague, and death. Now, what this uh, little bio failed to mention is uh, paintings of his like Isle of the Dead and his real symbolic uh, symbolist work, which is what I am pre predominantly familiar with. And I can see that there are often scenes of pious women 
um, in his paintings, but uh, there's a lot of mood and atmosphere. And uh, like I said, explore that link and learn more about him if you are not familiar with this amazing artist. And uh, I wasn't aware that he was inspired by uh, Camille Corot and the Barbizon School. And uh, I'm not surprised because that is where tonalism sort of became codified. Um, I'd have to say Camille Corot, really the first tonalist, although I have uh, done studies uh, after the Dutch guys who you could you could type as tonalist as well, but there is the Dutch school already, and um, it has its own things that define it uh, that, that aren't necessarily included in the, the uh, standard definition of tonalism. And uh, as far as getting into standard definition of tonalism, I would say, first of all, it's a coloristic approach. So um, you, def you, <coughs> you are definitely tying the painting together with a, um, a unifying tone of some type. This can be accomplished with glazes or uh, most often I accomplish it just by setting out to have all my colors relate to each other on my palette. Um, and then of course I can always do a little glazing too, you know. But um, it's color and then subject matter, um, landscapes usually with no people or very minimal people and um, the people aren't the subject of the painting and uh, and it's all about capturing an evocative mood and a feeling and um, in this way it differs from impressionism which you know of course captures a feeling but those feelings are generally one of a bright day uh, you know, like a picnic or something like that and there's nothing wrong with that I'm not dissing it um, it just doesn't resonate with me as a artist uh, it's not the way I want to work um, anyway so there you go now uh, we've got about ooh, I know, three or four minutes left in this video here uh, what's happening in the studio um, I have uh, finished some paintings recently which I photographed uh, last night including a study of uh, John Francis Murphy I did for somebody um, and uh, four other paintings uh, which you know pretty okay you know um, none of them are stupendously awesomely amazingly great but uh, none of them are super bad so um, it's just adding to the body of work and that's good um, I'm always trying to move the I'm always trying to you know move those goalposts a little further down the line and uh, um, but yeah, I'm not so bothered by not having you know uh, masterpieces per se I'm concerned with creating a body of work and uh, to me it's all about painting every day and trying to get better and like I say moving the goalposts trying to trying to paint scenes that are better um, that are more evocative um, and of course I'm always endeavoring to work larger these days as well so um, also let's see I was in the studio this morning uh, did some, uh, you know, uh, liquiding uh, over the surface of some dried paintings. That what that does is basically kind of evens out the dull and the uh, shiny aspects of the painting. That's the main reason I do it. Uh, painters in the past would do something called oiling out. Um, I don't do the oiling out because basically after that oil is absorbed in the painting, you have the same issue. So oiling out is a good step to do. Um, if uh, you're just, you know, in fact, I do oil out my drawings uh, stage now on the burn number. I noticed I've had to do that because I'm drawing with the uh, the ivory black, and I get patches that are very, very matte, and uh, very hard for me to judge my values uh, in that way. So um, you'll just notice in some of those paintings where I have a drawing already done uh, that uh, I'll, I'll rub it down with some oil, or you might not even notice that because I don't always videotape that step of the process. Um, and uh, well it's been going okay in some cases uh, that oiling out is uh, end up erasing bits of my drawing uh, surface so I'm, uh, uh, I'm working with that I've been working with the uh, quick dry gambling um, ivory black and you know it dries quick it's good but it's not as quick a dryer even with the alkaloid in the paint as some of my other uh, paints and um, whatever it needs to be you know I always need to be wary of that 
Anyway, I can see we're getting close to the end. If you dig my channel here, subscribe to it. I don't do any weird pop-ups or anything, but um, I do like people to subscribe to the channel. Uh, I'm very consistent, and I will get you guys some videos every week. Uh, so if you're into watching this kind of thing, um, I'm here for you. Uh, also, you can go to my website, landscapepainter.co.nz, and as I pointed out earlier in the video, um, there's a corresponding blog post which you can get to very easily from my website. There's a tab page for that. So I uh, will be back tomorrow, uh, which is uh, Sunday, and um, actually it's going to be Sunday the 11th. And uh, meanwhile, take good care and stay out of trouble. We'll see you tomorrow.